Welcome to the Be Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hello again. As you listen to this, I'm still in Papua New Guinea, just in the final days of my tour there for the Mount Hagen Sing Sing Festival. I know you're jealous, especially if we're Facebook friends and you're seeing the photos that I'm posting. If we're not Facebook friends, friend me, you'll be able to see them. Hopefully those images will get you jazzed up to join me for next year's tour in August. You can find out all about it at wandertours.com. I know you're here today to listen to today's guest, so I'll get on with it. Today's conversation is with Beth Massa. Beth is a sustainable packaging entrepreneur. Yeah, I know. Just like me, you may ask, what the heck is that? It's definitely not a term you hear every day. Basically, Beth is, as we all should be, very concerned about the environment and our impact upon the planet. She happens to be doing something about it in a very direct way by addressing the problem in her adopted home of Amsterdam. Beth is creating a first-of-its-kind retail store. You'll hear her describe it in detail, but in short, it's a store that doesn't carry any products in single-use plastic containers. Until you really start paying attention, you probably don't realize how much trash you're generating using single-use containers. Now, my awareness was only heightened after watching and being horrified by the documentary, A Plastic Ocean. I watched probably the first 20 minutes and it completely changed things for me. Now, I can't make a purchase now without questioning whether I really need that item, but also questioning whether the item needs all the packaging that it comes in. As an example uh, of what I've changed, John and I have begun taking our own containers to our local health food store to make our own peanut butter rather than buying it in plastic or glass containers that just get thrown out or, you know, perhaps recycled, but they're just, you know, they're getting tossed away. Also, what we're doing is when we buy from bulk bins, we now often carry our own bags to put items in rather than just using the bags that are provided. So we're trying to get more than one use out of anything that comes into the house. So there are a couple of examples of how we've changed uh, some habits. But Beth Massa is realistic in believing that people aren't necessarily going to make big changes on their own. She wants change to happen with the manufacturers and producers of the products. And her store will only carry goods in containers that are not single use. Now, this is a pretty bold move, taking on an industry. But the other part of her story is her move to Amsterdam. She used to live in Seattle. She's an American. She was so solid in knowing that she wanted to live there that she spent a couple of years figuring out how to make it happen. That singular focus of wanting something so badly that all of your waking time is spent figuring out how to make it reality is often a theme here at the podcast. I know that feeling, and it's likely that you know that feeling too for something that you've wanted to do. So you'll hear how she made that happen. Before I get to our conversation, do me a favor, please share this episode with one person whom you think might enjoy it. That's all I ask. That's easy. Just one person. Thank you. <laughs> Let's get to this conversation with Beth Massa. You lived in Seattle. I know you're in Amsterdam now, and you've been here about a week. What was your first craving? <laughs> like when you came back to Seattle, did you say, oh my gosh, I have to go to this bakery or I have to go to this coffee shop or like, what did you do? You know, it, that my answer to that question changes, has changed throughout the years, but it's always the most accessible food that's something you would never eat if you actually lived here. So it's like Top Pot or something like that, the donuts. But I was like, I got to get the coffee, you know, go to Ladro or Vivace or something and the Seattle sushi. Where do you go for sushi? I'm so out of touch now. I just went out with friends and said, take me, take me where you love to go. And so we were in somewhere downtown. And then do you bring coffee back with you when you go? Or are you pretty set in Amsterdam with... No, I would, except for that I try to travel without having to check a bag. So ah, my... yay. Good for you. You know what? I just chatted with Patricia Schultz for the podcast, and she's the author of A Thousand Places to See Before You Die. I'm a huge advocate for carry-on luggage. And she said, nope. She goes, checked bag is the way to go. (laughs) Like, that's absolutely what she does. And I was just so surprised that she had suggested that. My reasoning is you're going to, for one, it's too easy for something to happen 
and she said that she just carries extra stuff with her, like a toothbrush and a change of clothes or whatever. So she's got that in a small bag with her. But I think she just doesn't want to deal with having to carry it through the airport, which is fair enough. But I don't want to risk it. I don't want to deal with everything that comes with a checked bag. Like yeah. having to wait for it, the anxiety if it's going to show up or not. I know, I know. And then just the temptation of buying a bunch of stuff you don't need because you know you have the space for it. Well, you know what I do, though? I often buy an extra duffel bag or bring a duffel bag or a compactable bag with me so I can bring souvenirs home. I do that too. But now I have a whole closet full of sort of low <laughs> quality duffel bags. And my mother does this oh. too. She's like, I'm going to bring some an extra bag over with some stuff for you and then leaves the bag. So I'm like, oh, no, I, yeah. I got a surplus of luggage. It's not good. Well, at least it's not plastic bags. That's true. <laughs> but I am very much an advocate of, you know, carry-ons and less. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. We have got a lot to talk about today. And you know, I, I actually, I want to split this up kind of into two parts, maybe not officially, but there, I want to come at this from two different angles. And one is the fact that you're an expat living in Amsterdam. And I know that there are a lot of people out there, a lot of listeners who are wishing <laughs> right now with our political climate. And um, no matter what side you're on, it's just not a great time. It's not a great time to be an American, I feel like, or even to be to be tuned into what's going on. And I know I know people who are leaving the country. I know you've been gone for a long time. So yours wasn't a political I'm getting out of here decision. But I do know people who are leaving for that particular reason. But I do want to talk to you just about being an expat and kind of the choice to move abroad and how that came about. But then you're also an entrepreneur. So you didn't just land in another country and take a job, which a lot of people do, but you decided to create a business. And I think that's like, you know, talk about bold moves. I think that is pretty cool. So I want to talk to you kind of, and it'll come out through this conversation. Those two different aspects will come out. So first, kind of give me the history of what brought you to Amsterdam, why you originally went, and maybe kind of how that, if it has morphed at all. You've been there 11 years, is that right? So talk about that. So the story goes like this. Uh, my best friend from high school married a German guy and li has lived in Cologne for over 20 years. And I was planning a trip to go visit her. And we were coming up with our itinerary and where do we want to go? And she said, why don't we put Amsterdam on the list? Be and it's only, you know, a couple hours away. And I said, yeah, sure. I've never been there. Let's go. So we booked in a day and a night. And I took two steps out of the train station. And I was just completely entranced with this place. It was a deeply visceral response that I had to Amsterdam. And um, we walked into a little random bar. There's a million of them that look exactly the same all over the city. And we met people there that are still my friends to this day. And it was just like this whole life I always dreamed of living was just waiting there for me to find it. What was it that was so entrancing about it? It was this current. It's the rhythm of the trams and the bicycles and the walkers and the water. And it all kind of was moving at the same pace. And people in Amsterdam sing and hum to themselves. And everybody looked really happy. You never see anybody walking alone. And not that that, of course, is, you know, a bad, there's no judgment value against that. It's just an observation. Did you notice that from day one? I noticed it was from day second one. Okay. Yeah. But, but so I'm wondering if, so somehow you got the vibe you got off the train and you, you thought, oh my gosh, this is really cool. And then you started noticing different habits that people had. Yeah, I did. And I wouldn't say that my transition to the city was devoid of any sort of political undercurrent. I would just sort of, it was softer. It wasn't, you know, a feeling like you just, you need asylum or something like that, you know, but I just, it was a very, it was always very positive and forward thinking. And for me, and this is a, this is a deeply personal conclusion that people are absolutely free to disagree with. But I just think in general, generalizing that the Dutch have figured out so much on how to live a happy life that Americans are just very far away from realizing and I think getting farther and farther away. So I just feel like I've kind of found my little corner of the world and I'm just stuck in there and I intend to stay. And I also remember I have this really vivid sort of sense memory of coming back after my trip, that first trip and coming back to work and just going, oh, hmm. 
know, the sort of like... Was that back in Seattle? Yeah. Was that (laughs) Microsoft or Amazon? This would have been Amazon, yeah, and my life there. And so I just became, I just became obsessed with, with Amsterdam. And I started going for visits about two times a year and thought, I need to move. I need to live in this place. And it, it took about two years to find the right job. Because at first I was pretty burned out on corporate life. I was like, I'm not, I can't work in corporate anymore. I'm just going to 10 bar for the rest of my life. and live in a tiny little one room. I don't care. And I just kind of started to think about what that might be like. And I just needed to kind of recover a little bit and, and get back into a more balanced um, perspective on my life and my job. And But it was, I think, even back then when it was easier to move than it is now, you have to be singularly dedicated to it because it's very difficult to find a job in Europe and move there. So what was the first job that you had? It was with Microsoft. Okay. And again, that was just a coincidence because I'd never worked for Microsoft here in the States. Um, I just got a call from a recruiter for a position I didn't even apply for. A recruiter here in the Seattle area? A recruiter in the Netherlands. No kidding. Yeah, I had put on the top of my resume at that point where everybody was still using Monster a lot, you know, very interested in, in moving to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And oh, that's that. crazy. Yeah. So how long from the, the from that time that you did that first visit with your friend to when that job offer came through? How long was that? It was two years, two full years of working on this full time. And I actually did get very close to a job offer at another company And I had been warned of like the Dutch directness. Of course, I was trying to be very sensitive to the cultural differences. But when it comes at you, you are wholly unprepared. And it was like the final, after two days of interviewing, like the final breakfast that we were were all having, that they were just being courteous and, you know, taking me out before I went on my play back home. And the hiring manager asked me this question and I answered it. I blew it. And um, I didn't, I didn't get the job, but it was great. It actually was like much better than I ended up at Microsoft anyway. Wait, how did you blow it? She said to me, one of the things I had to do in the process of this, of this interview was put together a presentation. They'd given an assignment, like how would you solve a problem? And I um, spent a lot of time on the deck, obviously. And I thought I presented it reasonably well. And um, at breakfast, she said, well, you know, a lot of the people that reviewed the deck thought that it was bad, that it was quite poor. And I was like, well, what do you mean that it's quite poor? I mean, I've put a lot of work into this and I feel like I answered it quite competently and and uh, defend, 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 defend myself and getting very, you know, indignant about this, you know, negative feedback. And it was completely the wrong reaction. In Dutch culture, you just expected to say, oh, really? So what did they have to say? Oh, I, I can see what their point of view. Oh, maybe I disagree with that. It's just a very kind of neutral sort of response. It's a culture of constant feedback, both negative and positive. And you're always expected to have an opinion and to voice that opinion and to no receive kidding. that opinion. Yeah. And it's a lot to get used to at first, but after you can get used to it, it's just a great way to communicate in a business environment. You always know exactly where you stand with people. Even friends. Sure. uh, My best friend in Amsterdam is Dutch, and we've talked about these cultural differences a lot because she sort of loves America as much as I love Holland. (laughs) And she said, the way it goes is that I have the right to hurt your feelings, and you have the right to have your feelings hurt. That sounds like New Jersey. (laughs) Is it? Yeah. (laughs) Or New York. um, Yeah. (laughs) And uh, and that's it. So um, it works really well. And um, I can't go back now that I'm integrated into this way of communicating. It would be impossible for me to kind of go to a softer, more passive aggressive way of communicating with people. So, well, so a bunch of questions. Isn't that the Amazon environment? No. I mean, if you have no, and I have a specific example, Amazon would say, well, we're very, you know, combative and it's all about, you know, getting to the truth of a situation and you're supposed to challenge each other, you know, but the one time that I actually tested that out, I was reprimanded severely. At Amazon. Mm -hmm. So how is that different from Amsterdam or Holland where you're supposed to have an opinion and kind of fight back with it or, or have your feelings hurt? How, how is that different than Amazon? Maybe I'm hearing it. Maybe I'm not hearing it correctly. So in in Amsterdam, you're saying that you have to accept it and go, oh, yeah, my feelings are hurt. How could I be better? And in Amazon, you're expected to fight back or no? No, I don't think so. I think that you're just a couple of things. One, of course, the Dutch are very egalitarian. So you don't have to feel afraid of confronting a boss or somebody maybe in a a superior position or a a person in power. And Amazon, I think that's totally not the case, even though they would like to think otherwise. And of course, this is me. This was a long time ago. I have no idea what the corporate culture is like now. And also, it's okay to express emotion. 
but they don't they don't express emotion as much they don't they don't act in an angry way they'll say i'm really angry about that right now you know which i think is much healthier or that really i found that very offensive rather than sort of retaliating because you're offended and also at microsoft netherlands again i've never worked at microsoft here it's a very supportive environment where the company is really invests in the individual almost at a spiritual level and in fact I wouldn't say almost I would say absolutely at a spiritual level it's very touchy-feely and I don't mean to say that like cynically I mean to say that in a positive way it's remarkable and the way that I described that as I always feel felt like at Amazon I was treated like a liability and at Microsoft Netherlands I really felt like I was an asset and I think that's like kind of the core difference, the way I'd summarize it between the two companies. And So you applied for a Microsoft job in Amsterdam, but you didn't get that one. No, it was for another company. Oh, I see. I see. So by the time the Microsoft one came around, you had learned a lesson at that point? I did. And also what happened was that that other company, it's Philips, I can say who it is, which is a Dutch company. There was another position that came up. And so I applied for that while the Microsoft position was also available. And, and I had said to... Uh, the Microsoft people, hey, you know, I'm already interviewing with Philips again, so I can interview with you and they'll pay for my flight. So maybe I don't know how ethical that was, but whatever, they would have done it anyway. So by the time Microsoft had interviewed me, gave me an offer, went through the salary negotiation and like kind of booked my, you know, start date, Philips hadn't even gotten around to making an offer. <laughs> and so when they finally did, I, the salary was about half of what it should have been. And so I told them that. And by the time they were scrambling to try and fix it, I was like, you guys know. And um, that's very Dutch. They take a very long time to do everything. And So there's some things that are part of the, the Microsoft culture, or let's just say any any company that is doing business in in Holland, that there's part of it that they maintain some of their American culture, like moving fast. And then there are other parts where they they're very much like touchy feely, where it's it's very much part of their yeah. Their, and that's uh, unique to the Netherlands. It would probably be totally different in Spain or Russia or Greece or wherever. I imagine they're pretty touchy feely in Spain they're too. Pretty <laughs> but they'll always say like you know if there's somebody you know from the U.S. presenting something in a way they'll always say oh that's so American and it's never met as a compliment. And you say no, it's not American. It's <laughs> well, I would say guys, there's 350 million of us, so I, I resent the generalization. You know? <laughs> yeah, as <laughs> as correct as it might be. Yeah. So. So what, what do you think it is that makes them happy? Well, it's the word gezelligheid. And um, I think in Dutch, I think, or no, in Danish, it's like, it's called higa or higa. I don't know. Like, oh, I do know that term. The yeah. Dutch version of it. Yeah. Yeah. Or, sorry, the Danish version of it sort of made it its way over here. And I think Germans have a similar word to it as well. But anyway, it's the idea of like coziness, togetherness feeling relaxed within yourself, coming into a warm cafe when it's raining outside and your friends are already waiting for you with a beer on the table. And family is very, very important to them. So families will often annually always go on vacation together. It's a really big deal for them. Mm-hmm. And it's a tiny country. The country is one-fifth the size of Washington State. So a lot of times they'll have like, you know, reunions with people they went to kindergarten with. And you can't travel two and a half hours in any direction without leaving the country. So it's not like going away from home is, you know, it would be like going going to Portland. You have to leave the country to actually get pretty far away from where you grew up. Do you think that we could ever get back to anything like that? Or are we just too big? Like I think of other countries, when you talk about the size and the happiness, I think of Bhutan, because this, the country is so small, and you can make changes that affect pretty much everybody in the country you know, small changes to make them happier. But we are so kind of out of control and we're so big. It's moving a huge ship, you know, like changing direction, you know, of a, of a huge ship. It's just not, it's not possible. It can't be done without a tremendous effort, it seems like. But do you think that there are, do you think that there's changes coming in the United States kind of from your outside perspective? Or? I think the changes have already happened. And, you know, I'll tell you this, when we left the United States, Bush was still in office and, we were like, this is just, what is going on? We were already upset then. And I only, when Al Gore, the, you know, the climate president didn't win under highly controversial and suspicious circumstances, I thought, you know what? People are going to raise up and we're going to take to the streets and we are going to protest this. And we didn't. And then Bush got reelected and then the war came. And we, our generation, sat it out because we were making a lot of money and the internet 
thing was still happening and we just got sucked into these lives and it didn't really affect us personally. And I've been wait, I've been saying for 20 years, like, when are we going to hit rock bottom? When is it going to get worse than this? Well, even with reality too, it like, can't get worse than the real world. It can't get worse than the Kardashians. And and now- And it keeps getting worse. Well, like, we have a reality TV star as the president of the United States. And I knew he was going to win because I said to my, my husband, reality TV and headlines are actually- whether we want to accept it or not, like true American values. It's the thing that we prioritize. And this is like the ultimate manifestation of that proclamation, you know? So I feel sort of validated in saying that. But I think that we have finally hit that rock bottom because look what's happening. They're not sitting it out. People are standing up, the Me Too movement and the gun control issues. I mean, people And the are, young people too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And the pink cat thing. Like it's, that's fantastic. And I, I think, God, what a great time to be a young person. And, you know, everybody, all young people want to rebel against something. And all they've got something real and they're affecting change and being on the cover of Time Magazine. I mean, how fun must that be? And that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. So I, I in, that cha- in that sense, I feel kind of optimistic. Like we have hit the rock bottom and now it's like uh, stirring the pot, boiling over, whatever, you know, metaphor you want to use. But. Mm, that's an interesting perspective because I feel like I, I don't know that we've hit rock bottom. I feel like the pendulum has shifted, you know, from Obama to our current president, whose name I don't say out loud <laughs> ever. And it seems like I like I, I, I traveled. I, I use this. I've been using this example for years and years. I traveled through Central America many years ago by motorcycle, and I got stuck in Nicaragua because the peasants had this big revolt. And it affected me. I could not get to Costa Rica because I was traveling by road, and they had shut down the roads. They had just, they had burning tires and logs and big trees across the roadways, and I could not get through. And, you know, on the one hand, I'm like, damn, I can't. I can't move forward. I can't get to Costa Rica. I've got a flight out of Panama that I have to get to. This is a real bummer. On the other hand, I thought more power to them. These are peasants who are showing who's got the power here. And they were able to really kind of rise up and make a difference by doing that. And I just thought that was awesome. And I just thought, man, I wish that we could do that. And in effect, we, quote unquote, did that. It just wasn't the people that I agreed with. By we, I mean the people who voted for the president. And so they got fed up with something and they voted somebody in who I just happened to disagree with. And I thought, I thought, shit, you know, I wanted this revolt. It just happened on the other side. And so that's how I've been looking at it. But what you're saying is, and I think it's very valid, what you're saying is that, yeah, we have the pendulum shifted, but now this kind of uh, this rising up from all these different movements like the Me Too movement um, and changes are happening, you know, with equality, sec- you know, gay marriage and that kind of thing. That kind of equality is happening as well, which is a great thing. So I think, yeah, it just seems like it's just so divided, so wide right now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who uh, who's going to get spat out on the other side, you know, in a positive way, like who's going to make it through the other side. But I think it's going to continue to shift and it polarize. Has. It's history, yeah. you know. It is. Yeah. So it is. We're just in the middle of a rather angular diversion at the moment. So. Yeah, I know. Well, and I know all we can do that and uh, this will get back to kind of your business too is that I feel like all we can do is just keep our head down and be positive and affect ourselves and our family and our community and our neighborhood the best we can because otherwise you have your head down on your on the desk and you're can't get out crying. of bed yeah. and you can't get out of bed and there's a lot of people who are going through that is that right right now is it that bad it is that bad maybe yeah Do i guess feel powerless i don't understand you that. are in you're you're in a happy spot yeah uh, john and i talk about this all the time i just i i say people are paralyzed and depressed and i mean i have people who have expressed a lot of depression to me that they are not motivated and, and they can't move forward because they're watching Rachel Maddow every night. I've never watched Rachel Maddow and I don't even know if that's a reference that you would understand. I know who but Rachel okay. Maddow is, yeah. So they're watching Rachel Maddow every night and they're getting totally depressed over it. And I just think you got to shut down the, you got to take care of yourself. They're, they're waiting it out. They're sitting it out. Just, I mean, like you can't do that. You don't get to have it both ways. I, I feel like you can't be depressed and not do anything and then talk about it. So. 
we all have, you know, so many options available to us to do something, anything, a little tiny thing. Yeah. Well, even if it's not in a political manner, though, my my thing is if you do get caught up in what's going on in a in a political way like that, that's great. And that's admirable. But if it's also making you so depressed that you can't do anything and you're paralyzed, because I see on people's Facebook feeds, like I um, have been working for the past year and a half against this issue. And I have to go off social media now. I'm so depressed. I'm drinking every night. Oh, I mean, wow. these are, yeah, this is, these are the things that I I'm seeing. I might not be aware of how bad that it is. Yeah. So. Like I, uh, one friend said, I'm, I'm drinking every night and um, I've got to stop this. I've got to take care of my family. And that's, yeah, wow. yeah, I know. Okay. I know. So yeah, that's the kind of thing that's going on. So I just think people need to focus, be positive and work toward something, which is what you're doing. Yes. Which Ta da! It's like, <laughs> I know it's a good segue there <laughs> in terms of what you are doing. Now, I have to admit, and I'm sorry that I'm going on and talking so much here, but I want to set the kind of set the stage. I saw on your Facebook page, maybe a couple of years ago, year and a half ago, that you were starting this business, and I didn't understand it. I'm not going to say yet what it is, I'll let you describe it. And I thought, that sounds interesting. Like I didn't understand the value or I didn't, I didn't understand how serious it was or how important it is. Recently, I heard a podcast where the guest was, had been featured in this movie, A Plastic Ocean. And then I thought, oh, huh, maybe I should watch that. I like documentaries, watched it on Netflix. I, actually, I watched like the first 20 minutes of it and I was so sickened by it that I couldn't continue to watch it. And I think really that's all anyone needs to do is watch the first 20 minutes of it and it will change their life. And then I started thinking about you and what you were doing. And I thought, oh, I get it now. And we have a mutual friend, Stiv Wilson, and I'll, I'll link to things in the show notes too. And I'll, I'll put a, a link to some things that he's working on as well. And again, he left the travel writing industry years ago to start working in this, uh, this area, which is in plastics and cleaning up the oceans. So drum roll. <laughs> now describe, this is all you now, just tell us what you are doing and describe it, what's driving you behind it too. Maybe I'll start with a context of how yeah, I got to please. this point. Or, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I was working at Microsoft and it's funny because they hired me to run a bunch of websites in a language I hadn't didn't know how to speak yet. And of course, this is in 2008. And I think that, you know, it was before the crisis, there's a lot of budget being thrown around and they just wanted like the girl from Amazon and the tiny little subsidiary. So I never really, you know, coming out of that, that moment of almost having that burnout and thinking, well, I just, I just want to live in the Netherlands and I'll do any job that's reasonable and somewhat intellectual stimulating, stimulating to do it. But as soon as I got there, I realized I still crave that giant impact because that's what we're used to at Amazon. You know, you do something, it makes the news. And they said, can you make us that thing where it's like somebody who bought this also bought that? Can you do that? <laughs> and I'm like, sure, I need about, you know, $10 million in five years to build it and or you can buy it. And they said, well, you've got six months and 75,000 euros. And I realized that they had no idea because it's just like a marketing organization. It's not a, there's no software engineers there. So I thought, what have I gotten myself into? And I continue to ask my, myself that question for the next 10 years. And it's not that I want to like be, you know, self-deprecating and say I didn't make a whole lot of impact there or anything, but I floated around a lot. I was sort of like the house pet, you know, in the organization. And it was great. They let me have a, the house pet have a really long leash and I did a whole bunch of different things. And, um, but I kind of got to the point where I'm like, if I feel like I can't really do, make an impact here that's satisfying to me, I'm, I'm going to have to move on with like, you know, under the best of circumstances, you know, no hard feelings at all. And so at this point, like, you know, the cloud is really coming into view. And I ended up hosting um, a bunch of scientific researchers at Microsoft's um, sort of dog and pony show for their um, Microsoft research division. And these guys came over there pretty cynical, you know, Microsoft's, you know, just coming out of its like decades long PR problem. And oh, what is this? What's going on? And they were just running around so excited by the end of the conference to see what we were doing from the research perspective. And I realized at that moment, this is the these are where all of Microsoft's best stories are coming from, and nobody's telling the story. And maybe it should be my job to tell the story. And so I went back and threw together a business case, and they said, okay, Beth, have your shot. Like, you can be the um, business development manager for academic researchers in the Netherlands. And the job was to take the researchers and, and migrate their work off of, you know, a desktop situation into the cloud, and it would accelerate their 
work, you know, exponentially. Super satisfying. Always the dumbest guy in the room. Everybody I worked with was like this mega genius. And I would be working with paleontologists or cancer research people or astronauts. I mean, it was super fun. But because I live in the Netherlands, which is, you know, a lot of the science they have is around water management. I started coming into contact with all these people starting to deal with this plastic pollution. And then I started to learn plastic pollution problem. And then I started to learn like what were the real root causes of this problem. And uh, I started to learn we are overwhelming the planet with plastic in the way that the recycling could never in a million years cope with. Literally in a million years, you're not even using yeah, that that's as Yeah, true. As or like, a, as you a know, term. a thousand years. Yeah. Um, and I started to learn about how the predatory practices of giant corporations in, you know, poor countries in Southeast Asia that have no waste management processes and buy everything in little single-use plastic sh- sachets that are low-grade materials, and then I come into contact with people like Steve. Steve Wilson is like my prophet. I think he would be really embarrassed if he heard me say that, but Steve, I just downloaded every single word that he said because he's just this like pure expert on this issue, and he, I love Steve because he's, he, he's angry and frustrated, and I feel <laughs> like I have to sort of, you know, say, say I'm angry instead of just show it, but he's like, oh, show it, and I, I just, you know, he gets to be like that, and that's great, and it was through people like Stiv and others that I said, I think Microsoft is in a great position to do something about this, you know, and I put together a whole project about how we could build this app, and it could, like, track, you know, branding and plastic types all over the world as a citizen science sort of thing. I got some real traction inside the company to do this, and I met with, you know, Stiv and a couple of other foundations to say, hey, we want to partner with you on this, and I, I'm getting some green lights here, and that doesn't happen very often, and that's great, and that was like the typical Microsoft thing where, you know, they just let you go as far as you can go until you need somebody else to take the risk with you, which is either budget or resources, and then that support evaporates. And it happened to me here again. And I was like, I can't let this happen to me anymore. And at this point now, I had learned so much. And I, I sort of became this passive expert. I'd learned so much about this issue through my, my clients and through people like Stiv that I felt it was a moral responsibility. It was a moral prerogative to participate in its solution to the best of my ability. And if I couldn't do that inside of Microsoft, then I had to leave. And that's what I've done. So the idea is that I am going to start this food retail business where all of the packaging, not just the bottles, but everything is uh, sustainable alternatives to single-use plastic, and all of it is returned for deposit. Most of it is reusable. Almost all of it is reusable, where it can't be reused like um, a glass kombucha bottle or something, then it's 100% recyclable without downcycling. So, you know, glass is a perfect example of that. How's the recycling environment in Amsterdam? Well, one would be shocked to see how, quote unquote, little recycling is going on in the Netherlands. Um, It's very hard, for example, to find a place to recycle plastic. The Dutch have very sophisticated incineration plants. And I want to make sure like incineration is absolutely under no circumstances the best option. But some incineration plants are better than others, and they convert that into, you know, energy. So I even, you know, in in the single use plastic that I still have to use in my personal life, I, I check it in the trash can, I don't recycle it, because I know it's not getting recycled. They don't recycle aluminum, but they also use very little aluminum. You know, like aluminum cans aren't really a thing. And then glass and paper are widely recycled. Why isn't aluminum used there? It's just that it's not a market for it. So people aren't drinking soda out of aluminum cans. Um, there's a far less processed food in general in the Netherlands. Than are they drinking here. soda at all? Um, yeah, but it usually comes in a plastic bottle. So model. a big, big two liter kind of thing. Well, a little or a little bitty, those little bitty glass ones that you see in Europe. So what were you seeing in terms of, I can't, recall the term that you use, the corporate plastic use or the corporate... Predatory practices? Yes. What is that? (laughs) Well, what'll happen is that maybe like somebody in the Philippines, the Philippines is one of the worst areas in terms of the percentage amount of trash that's entering the ocean from Southeast Asia. Like the Philippines and India, I think are right at the top of the list. They're the ones who are dumping it or they're the ones who are getting dumped on? No, they're dumping it. Well, it's both. It's coming all over the place. And the reason for that is because most people in the Philippines or too many people in the Philippines cannot afford, say, a, a big bottle of shampoo that might last them a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So they buy single servings of, you know, shampoos and soaps and shaving cream and toothpaste and things like that. And these little plastic sachets, like we would see if you get like a sample from your hairdresser or something. And those sachets are mixed material packaging, which is plastic and paper and probably something else. Very, very low value. And it's lightweight. 
So maybe if you try and throw it away, it might just like blow around and this stuff is happening in its millions. And so what's happening is a company like Unilever, for example, which is like deeply entrenched in Southeast Asia, are selling their product in these little sachets that are just destroying the environment. And of course, the bottled water issue there is a huge issue as well. So instead of investing in infrastructure where tap water could actually be clean or somehow like well water or something like that is um, available to people, they have no choice but to drink bottled water. And then they have no waste management system at all to deal with this stuff. You said the Philippines. And what was the other country you India. It? So Philippines, India, China are um, kind of the three big egregious polluters. But people are just so easy or they're so it's so easy for people to blame individuals and that is, it's and, and the corporations are thrilled with that, you know. And that was another thing with Ozarka. Ozarka, you know, I and Ozarka is your is oh, your company. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I should get back to this later. But I mean, one of the things that we really want to do, even when we only open one store, is to create a communication platform where we can start getting the truth out about what's happening in in areas of the planet where there's a where the plastic pollution problem is at its most intense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and basically, I want we want to pick a fight a little bit, you know, and call these guys out. In a way that was like, we're a retailer, we're not an activist, and we're like rejecting your entire model, and here's why. Even if it's just in our little store. And hopefully our customers will, you know, participate in that model with us to kind of, you know, get to reduce the amount of pet plastic in their own life, but say, hey, I stand for something here, you know. Are there other people trying to create a store like yours, do you know? No, we're totally unique. We get confused a lot with like the no packaging stores and the no packaging stores are basically kind of glorified. I don't mean to be cynical about it. It's great what they're doing, but they're glorified bulk food bins. And it's not little bags of lentils that are like trashing the planet. You know, it's the processed foods or the prepared foods. And and so the problem I have with the no packaging stores is they're still putting the burden of the packaging issue on the customer. It's just before you walk into the store, you have to get all your bags and all your bottles and do your stuff. And then what do you Which do? Which isn't a bad thing. But it's terribly inconvenient you're not going to get mass adoption and you can't buy meats or there's a lot of stuff that you can't buy bringing in your own stuff it gets weird you know there's a lot of health and uh, health issues sanitation issues and I think people are just people are busy and they're just going to forget so you're trying to force it force change at the production level at the retail level what we're trying to do is make as minimal a shift as possible from ever from people's everyday shopping habits in order to make those habits sustainable and that's quite in order to make that convenient and enjoyable and easy there's a lot of complex thinking that needs to go into that in order to arrive at a simple and elegant solution and that's what we're trying to achieve do you mean there has to be a lot of thinking on your part or on the consumer's part on our part we don't want the consumers to have to think about anything exactly yeah Yeah. i was gonna say you want you want to make that easy so i want to make that clear yeah and we want it to be beautiful and exciting and they walk into something that's special we don't want it to feel like this sort of kind of 70s hippie you know birkenstocks and socks thing not that there's anything wrong with no because you're in seattle yeah i know sorry (laughs) seattleites you know mad love to the birkenstocks and the socks and you know but not the Gore-Tex because um, we can talk about microfibers too it's like trashing the planet as well but you know we want people to feel like that the sustainability aspect of our business is part of an upmarket experience mm-hmm. who's producing your food then it, it'll just be all the regular suppliers that all of our competitors are using so our our philosophy and this is this is a really important topic that this can lead into our philosophy is local and less so wherever we can source within the netherlands we will do that first and then europe and then as close to outside as europe as possible so so the issue here means that our selection will be reduced as a result of that yeah of course because if people want mangoes in february that means they're going to have to come from brazil and we are simply unwilling to do that but we hope we can and we're going to tell that story in the store like the mango section will be empty and be like hey little the, the guys are on their way they'll see you in april or whatever but in the meantime here are these great frozen strawberries that you can do something wonderful with you know and just merchandise the story in a way it's always positive and delightful and engaging and and just to have people like build that trust with people or they know to be as sustainable as possible and you know the 100% nirvana of sustainability no one knows what that looks like yet but we're going to go on this journey with our customers together and say we are as sustainable as we can possibly be right now, and it's only going to get better. Mm-hmm. So you'll work with, let's say, a local farmer or a, a local company that's manufacturing a type of food, a cheese, let's say, because sure. right, you're in Amsterdam. Yep. And you'll say, when you provide us with product, we need it in this packaging. Is that how it would work? In some instances, yeah, or it might not be packaged at all. So with our customers, there's two issues that we have to think about. How do they get the food home, and then how do they store it when it's there? 
And so again, a lot of that dilemma or that challenge is solved with the return for the, po- the all the packaging that's reusable and has a return for deposit on it. Of course, customers are free to bring in their own packaging if they would like under you know the correct hygienic circumstances. And um, we're going to be using a lot of alternative materials like bees wraps, for example. What's a bees wrap? Bees oh bees wraps. Is great. <laughs> it they're sort of aluminum foil and a saran wrap or plastic wrap alternatives, and it's it's a linen that's 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 soaked in beeswax and resin. In, and it's got kind of a natural antibiotic quality to it, and it's a wonderful product. I think I've recently seen something about this, like a, maybe a little video or something come across my Facebook. It actually it. works. We test everything. There's, the other thing that's really popular right now is are these like like these sort of flexible silicone lids. Maybe you've seen the advertisements for these come through your fi- feed, through your Facebook feed. They don't work at all. Um, <laughs> okay, but, but the bees wraps are you know they've got the Ozarka stamp of approval. I actually and, make my own at home, and they're so. uh, reusable. They are. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So it's not one time use, and you toss it out. Okay. What can we do as individuals just to be better for the planet? Like I, I know what you're saying is you're creating a store that is going to to make it easier for the individual so that so a person doesn't have to give so much thought or have to remember to bring their container or bring bring their reusable plastic bag but one of the things that I've learned that has really you know I I lead tours and I have always encouraged my tour people to bring a reusable bottle rather than us going through bottled water because I know especially in Bali and in Bhutan and all these places you know where people are drinking a lot of water there's so many millions and billions of plastic bottles going into landfills because they're not recycling. So I'm trying to educate people about that just in terms of that aspect. What can people do to make it more manageable for themselves that they can help the planet? Because it's not, I mean, we could sign a, we could sign a petition against Unilever or whoever it is who's at the core of this. Is that the best route to go? Or do we need to do things on a personal level as well? I would say yes to everything, but in general, it's very, very hard for people to live sustainably and grocery and food retailers make it very hard for us to do. And that's another thing at Ozarka that we talk about a lot, that we are not radical extremists. And if we can't make this easy and enjoyable for ourselves, then we can't expect anybody else to participate in the model as well. And I was actually really surprised coming back here to the States and going into a grocery store. The plastic problem here is way worse than it even is in in Europe. I mean, all the milk and cream are in plastic jugs. Here and, in Seattle, or do you mean... Well, you... Seattle as well, but also, you know, where I've been in the, I've been in the Midwest for a couple of days, and I'm yeah. still seeing like dozen eggs in plastic boxes, it was, containers. It was strange to me. So... All you can do is make it personal for yourself and it's about changing habits and changing habits is hard and to keep plugging away at it and to know that you are a part of a movement. Decide personally for yourself, I am subscribing to a movement and you know, the simple things you can do are proactively when you're at a restaurant saying, you know, I'll have the uh, mushroom and gruer omelet and a fresh orange juice and please don't bring a straw or rewarding yourself that one time you did remember actually to bring, you know, your reusable bags into the grocery store and you know, the, um, I'm a big fan of, of Soda Stream, for example. Soda Stream is great because Soda, you know, it's about, Soda Stream is a great example of the way that you change behaviors and change sort of attitudes about um, processed food and drink because you can go to a, a Soda Stream is the little um, carbonation machine yep. you have at home. Yep, we have one. And when you filled that thing 10 times a day and you get your carbonated water for free, basically, mm-hmm. you would never go buy it ever again for $2. You feel like a chump. Right. Mm-hmm. That is a behavioral change that that device can create in you. You know, these types of things, I think. And when you know that, like, I am doing my part in the tiniest way is multiplied by millions and millions of people participating in the same thing, then then that's where the impact will come. But right now to say, I'm going to refuse buying anything that Unilever ever makes, it's just, it's just too hard. Right. It's not not practical. It's not practical. I'm so glad to hear you say that because, well, I just finished off a container of spinach that was in a big non-reusable plastic thing and it's sitting down on the counter ready to go out into the recycle bin. And I thought, oh, Beth is coming over. You know, you know, what if she's going to see this plastic here? But, but you realize the practicality of it that you can't, 
be perfect. Like, do you know about that gal in New York? Yes, um, Lauren. Tr- trashes for tossers, tossers or something yeah. like that. She's a radical extremist. Yeah, yeah she I love is, her. Yeah, she's a but, great example, yeah. but not practical. But not practical. Not, not practical but she's for... been great about raising awareness yeah. on this issue. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So. I, yeah, that's funny. Oh, I was going to say, so the soda stream, because we use that, and then I just bought a package of metal straws, too, because... You know, again, in my ignorance, and I feel like, you know, this is really something that I am just starting to learn about myself. I never gave a second thought to metal straws or to the fact I gave a little bit of more thought to this, but, you know, go I go up to Starbucks or I go to my lo- local coffee shop and they put two paper cups together because it's so hot or you you get the, the sleeve around the paper cup because it's so hot. And I just thought, you know what, it, it's just going to go in the recycling bin. That's not such a bad thing. But I recently just bought re, just reusable coffee stainless steel mugs. And now I just carry that around with me. And it's You've it, changed a habit. I have changed a habit. And it seems really like, duh, like, why didn't I do that five years ago or 10 years ago or whatever? It just didn't occur to me, you know, and I I didn't have anybody pointing it out to me. It was just, again, after I saw this film and also, you know, another film that I saw um, documentary recently was Fast Fashion. It's called Fast Fashion. And that horrified me sure. just in yeah, terms the of industry is horrible. It is. Yeah. And just how and then we're marketed to to get rid of our clothes every month or two months or however fast it is and they don't last and we're quote unquote out of fashion so quickly so that's all of that stuff is in there and I think just having these kinds of conversations is really helpful for people so they so little light bulbs start going off that's it it's it's about awareness and maybe with the the reusable coffee mug that you bought maybe you'll forget to use it every once in a while but you'll be intensely aware of that Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you forget it half the time, that's still half the time that you're using it anyway. And, you know, we've tried all the reusable coffee mugs, so I have my preferences for the ones that I like the best. And also with the straws, we can have a little bit of fun with it. You know, it's it's not that fun to drink an iced latte or a smoothie without the straw. So we've tried the glass ones and the silicon ones and the paper ones and the metal ones on all different types of beverages. And it's almost like, well, you have the right wine glass for the right thing. You can do that with straws too, you know? Yeah. You need the right thickness, right, yeah. for a smoothie. And that's the other thing too that I want to get the message out about plastic. Like tactily, it's not it's not a nice thing to hold in your hand. It's flimsy and it's lightweight and it and it feels cheap. And we should get back to consuming our food and drink and materials that, that feel nice and feel quality. And they could go in a whole other philosophical discussion about that, about how disconnected we are and how shopping is, is filling a hole that is there that should be there with like real communication and contact and it's one of the things I love about Europe is that cafe life, you know, they've just always, if you and your friends have the one cafe you always go to, you can always go there and somebody you know will probably be there. But that, you know, that's a just, whole other that's... rabbit hole. But I mean, I don't understand, of course, I'm a little bit older, but every time I see like Primark or H&M and I, you know, those bags with all those clothes, knowing that some girl or some young boys will wear that stuff for a couple of months before it starts to, starts to fall apart. Right. And they paid $50 for two huge bags is the of camp- clothes. There's a like campaign here where it's like, there's this one girl and she said, I got paid 50 cents to make this. And then there's another girl that's kind of her age. They're both like, you know, pretty teenage girls. And she says, I paid $50 for this. And it's the same shirt. Yeah. Stuff no. like that is like, you I mean, know. I'm not that tuned into advertising, so I don't know. But oh, well, these are like, sense. you wouldn't miss it then if it was, they're on billboards. All oh, over no, Europe I haven't stuff. I was seen wondering it. if that kind of communication has started here as well. No, yeah. I, mean, I don't think it's on mass. It should be though. Yeah. Actually, the clothing industry it, you know, we talk about the plastic soup in the ocean is now actually becoming a plastic smog as these micro particles get smaller and smaller and smaller. But it's really the microfibers coming from synthetic clothing, which are just freaking, you know, unimaginable havoc on the oceans right now. So, and the thing is, we don't know. It, you know, I was talking to one of my scientists in my little group about this, and she said, "There's this, there's a sort of approach with scientific rigor that says." We don't, we don't know exactly what this is. We're pretty sure it's really bad. And we don't really have the time to prove it. You know, We don't really have the time to wait until it's proven to make a decision that we should probably stop this. You, you mean know? the microfibers? Yeah, or anything like that. We're like, yeah, we well, probably... Well, it's like GMO. 
yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I have kind of a different attitude about GMO than maybe a, a lot of people do, but this is the one, the frame of reference where I have this conversation. But politicians can use that all the time. They're like, well, it hasn't been proven yet. We don't know. We're like, yeah, well, it's pretty definitive that it's like, yeah, that this is really bad. And like, don't throw science up in it just like, you know, in people's faces when it just serves your agenda. But yeah, having, um, you know, petroleum based microfibers floating around the ocean where the food that we eat is consuming it. And it's probably like blocking the sun from all the phytoplankton that provides all of our oxygen for us in the ocean. Probably not a good thing. Well, you're very up to speed and knowledgeable about all of this stuff. Where would you suggest a beginner go? Absolutely. Start with the Story of Stuff campaigns. That's Steve Wilson's campaign. They do these really fascinating and comprehensive movies and little animations on the end-to-end industrial complex that is the plastic pollution, the plastic industry. Is that their website, Story of Stuff? Yeah, if you just Google Story of Stuff, it comes up. Okay. So So that's going to provide people with a background on what's happening in the industry? Yeah, they do a very good job. It's very engrossing and engaging to watch this this stuff it isn't like dry or sort of overly academic and it tells that the the very comprehensive story of of plastic what gave you the confidence to pursue something like this so ozarka you're are you open yet as a business we're going to start our pilot in about a month okay congratulations on that so you're not quite open but you're working on it what just gave you the confidence to say this is what i want to do and i'm going to go for this this is something that comes quite naturally to me. And so I, I get that word brave gets thrown in my direction a lot. And I don't feel brave at all because it doesn't feel scary to me. And I've done this several times in my life where I'm making these enormous leaps in like lifestyle change because it excites me. And um, I get very singularly focused on these things that I want. And Ozarka is, falls in the camp of these moments in my life where I made the decision or the decision is made, made for me or it just... It's something in me that says, you must do this and you're going to do this. So what's that like for you when you make a decision and you know that it's the right one or it's something that you want to pursue, like if it's a lifestyle change or it's a business, how does that, like, how does that make you feel? I don't mean to sound like a therapist, but I'm just wondering like viscerally, how does that come out? It's a high, it's sort of like, in some ways it's euphoric, it's a euphoric feeling and it's not sustainable. And then I'll be sort of exhausted by it for maybe like a couple of years after I go through one of these waves. It's only happened to me two other times. The first time was, no, three other, well, the first time it happened to me was when I really wanted to move to Seattle. The second time, and that I, was from Michigan, were you? Yep. Mm-hmm. The second time it happened was when I really, really wanted to be a music editor at Amazon, and I had never published anything professionally in my whole life. The third time, did was, you get that job? I did. Okay. Yes, I was the second music editor hired for the team, actually, and the first woman. And um, the third time was when I wanted to move to Amsterdam, and now we're sort of in the fourth wave of Beth's manic, you mm. know, like up here mode with this like singular focus. And um, I don't want to call it an obsession that sounds negative. This is just what I'm doing now. I've made this huge change. And this is who I am now. So and it's great. And it's all on my own terms. You know, I'm done proving myself. Um, I spent a lot of time feeling like I had to prove myself that I wasn't deserving of where I was. And now I don't feel that way anymore. And it, it took a little bit of coaching actually to sort of get me over that. Was that because you were working for someone else? You had to kind of live up to to something else? I think it was because I felt ashamed of the sort of like the authentic version of myself, that there was something not good enough or wrong with me. That uh, And I always surrounded myself by people that I admired, you know, in order to not necessarily emulate them, but just sort of feel, feel better about myself. Like, look at, look at the company that I keep, these amazing people. But it never made me feel like I was their equal. And then I always felt like a failure. And I am the shop girl. I've always been the girl, the, the, you know, the, Ozarka is the name of um, the record store I used to manage in college. And it was one of the best jobs I ever had for a variety of reasons. I'm the shop girl. You know, I joke with my partner, though, I re- my real dream is to have Ozarka up and running and I'm just pushing a broom in the store and greeting customers. And nobody knows that I'm the owner. Why? What do you mean by shop girl? Like, what, what does that mean to you? I am a professional futzer. I like to futz around all day long. And having a shop is great because you're on your feet all day, which I need to be on my feet all day in order to be happy. And it's just a steady stream of a moderately um, of moderately difficult work that's like constantly changing all the time. So the shop is great for me because I get to be on my feet. I'm physical. But then there's also like the, the digital piece, the marketing, the marketing piece of it, the back end software engineering piece of it. I love all of it in equal measure. And so it's a real balance for me to get to just sort of 
So you like to multitask? No, I'm terrible at multitasking. But I like to do a bunch of different things linearly. (laughs) <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for that distinction because yeah. I think that's that's more what I meant. Okay. Not not trying to do this not trying to do a bunch of things at the exact moment. But you like to be in a day, you like to have many different things going on, kind of a variety. And that's your happy place. That's my happy place, yeah. So there is no downside to this for me. You know, I get asked the question a lot, well, what's the downside of being an entrepreneur? And I can't answer that question yet. Maybe I will, but I kind You of don't think it. about a downside. Well, when you're doing this for yourself on your own terms, the work that you would normally hate to do, it has such a purpose behind it that you don't even mind it. You sort of enjoy it. But uh, would, wouldn't the downside be failure? No, because I, so here's another aspect of my personality that's maybe somewhat unique. I have no fear of failure. And it's not that I think I'm never going to fail. I just don't care if I do. Because I have to try this. I have to do this. There's nothing else that I want to do. So it, failure isn't really even relevant to my pursuits. There's a couple things that that come to mind just because you are very, you're very singularly focused. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately. There's two things. And I tie these together because the way you've described them, to me, in my own mind, they're very similar. The first is place and feeling comfortable somewhere. And I've been giving this a lot of thought because I was just in New Jersey, New York City and New Jersey. And I grew up in New Jersey and I spent a lot of time in New York. And but I live in Seattle and I feel it I feel really at home in Seattle. And when I go, even though I spent I don't know how many years in New Jersey growing up, so twenty years, let's just say, in 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 New Jersey, kind of New York area. But I always felt like I was trying to be something else when I was there. I I didn't and I and it only really really hit me on this last trip. It was really interesting because I touched down, I looked at the Teva sandals that I had on my feet and I touched down at JFK and I just thought I'm going into New York and I have two pairs of shoes. I have a pair of Tevas and I have a pair of running shoes. And it never occurred to me that I needed something dressy to wear. And I thought, oh, I'm just comfortable with who I am in my sandals. And I don't care what what anybody says. But the reason I left this area is because I want to be in an area where I can feel comfortable in what I'm wearing and it's, and I don't have to put on heels and I don't have to put hairspray on and a ton of makeup and have my nails done because that's not me. And so it sounds like you, when you, you know, stepped, took your first step into Amsterdam, you felt home. I did. And, you know, I have a little saying for that feeling and it's that my entire life I have always felt like a foreigner and in Amsterdam I am a foreigner and it fits really, really well. And I have always, in the corporate world or in any job that I had, not, I didn't try to fit in. I tried to make that environment fit me. And it was always a struggle and it never worked. And so, and, you know, another reason that Ozarka excites me so much is that I can create this entire world that fits me to my own specifications, that I can really feel great about the person that I am and the environment that I have created for myself. Because I was never able to feel the feeling that I have now working in a company. So... Now, do you feel more home or more foreign? Well, to me, the two are sort of interchangeable. I, I, I've, I don't want to say I feel comfortable feeling different. I don't really know how different I am, how different anybody is. But I feel like myself, you know, like for the first time without any packaging around it um, or a frame. And that comes with clothing, too. I get, I get rid of all my high heels. I did like my high heels back then, you know, mm-hmm. I did. But I can't wear them anymore because they're like physically it's quite painful. <laughs> But it was sort of a symbol to me that I was just like, now I'm, I'm in flats all the time. I got work to do. I'm on my feet all day running around. I'm not sitting in, you know, conference or conference calls or meetings or whatever. Um, and it's just, that's it. That's who I am. And I, I really, I really love it. It feels like such a relief. I wish I would have gotten to this place in my life 10 years ago, but maybe a lot of people feel that way. But you wouldn't be who you are and you wouldn't have the opportunities, either financial backing or whatever it is that, that you have now that you wouldn't have had that 10 years ago. I was thinking about something. I I tend to think, I I tend to try to make sense of things in the world to myself in terms of, you know, metaphors. 
And I was thinking about when you download an app and there's like the little line that makes the circle. Yeah. And when the two lines at the top touch, then the app is completely downloaded. My, my circle went really, really slowly. It took a long time <laughs> for my little, uh, for the circle to be completed, for Beth Massa to be fully downloaded. But I think it's, you know, it's happening now. I, I have a interesting way about my, that, that I describe myself. At least I don't know if I've ever said this out loud to anybody, but, um, but I always think about it. I had a Dodge Dart that was was that my first car? I think my first car was a Dodge Dart. I loved that thing. It was a 76 Dodge Dart that had been owned by some little old lady with no mileage on it, right? It was just great. And I'm embarrassed to say that I could drive that car 100 miles an hour. Like I did, I took it out on the highway and I could get it to 100 miles an hour and I loved it. But it was always slow to start, but it, but then it would do 100. I no. could get it to 100. <laughs> yeah. And I think that about myself. I think I'm slow to start, whether it's life, yeah, I'm 52. So whether I had a slow start in life and now I feel like I'm on this trajectory or it's anything that I do, I it takes me some time to get up to speed and then, you know, that I'm off to the races. It's so, great to know that. Yeah, it is. And so that, and then I can be patient with myself yes, if I don't, it. yeah, if I don't understand something or, you know, if it just takes me longer to kind of, to, to understand something, that's just the bottom line. Then I just think, you know what, just keep at it and eventually you'll excel at it. So um, one other thing that I'll tell you too, is that we have a friend who recently moved to Amsterdam. You know, I've never been other than the airport, which is really embarrassing to admit. And I, and I just recently I've been thinking, you know, why don't, uh, because I'm through that airport often. I mean, once every year or two years or something, like, why aren't I tacking on extra time just to go visit Beth and my friend Jig who just moved there. So we have this friend who just moved there and he said, I don't feel comfortable in the United States. I'm not comfortable here. I'm going to go move there where I where I feel just where I feel more comfortable. Like he's always felt out of sorts here. And I thought, and I think it's, I just thought that was him. And to hear you echo something like that, that you feel more comfortable there, I think is, uh, is really interesting. So worth a visit. What's worth a, a visit? Little, biking trip or something uh, it's one of those cities that every that no one doesn't like like no one says god i just hate barcelona like nobody says that yeah you know nobody says it about amsterdam either yeah so. okay well uh yeah we'll have to get that come on to, over i know that's I know, weird I know. <laughs> that's where our global traveler has never been to one of the most popular tourist destinations i think that's world. probably why oh, okay. because i i think i try to i generally reject that kind of thing. I'm like, oh, I want to go somewhere else. You know, I'm, I'm always looking for kind of off the beaten path. The weird thing about Amsterdam is that there are way too, I mean, way too many tourists and that the city is becoming quite crowded now, but there are no tourist traps. And so there, it's not schlocky. Okay, I will do that. Um, the other thing that I'm tying into that, so that, that sense of place that you have and that sense of certainty around it, as if you're really, really in tune with yourself, it sounds like in your gut or your heart or your mind or your soul or whatever you want to call it, it sounds like you, you bring that same thing to what you do. Like you have had these lifestyle changes that you call them. You've made decisions and you've just been full steam ahead, completely forward. There aren't a lot of people, I think, that that do that. And I've been, it's, it's interesting, just this morning I was doing some journaling around this and about there have been times in my life where I have felt so certain about something. And I've had people who are detractors because that's the way people are, who've told me you can't do that, or that's not viable, or that doesn't make sense. And I've just thought, no, this is how it is. This is, this is what I'm going to do. And the times when I don't really know that, and I'm kind of looking out the window going, what's the next move? What's the next trip? What's, what's the next business move? When I'm floating around like that, I, it's hard for me to get started. But once I land on something, I'm like, oh yeah, full steam ahead. And every cell in my body and every decision I make is, is directly toward that. It sounds like you're, you're the same way. Do you feel like that? I do. And um, a friend of mine wrote wrote this book. His name is Thor Muller. And the book's called Get Lucky. And it's this great book about serendipity. 
and how people often confuse that term with just pure, you know, with just luckiness, random luckiness, and it's actually not. And I feel like I'm a very serendipitous person because I feel like once I make the right decision for myself, then these sort of almost seemingly miraculous coincidences come into my life of somebody I meet that's very useful to whatever it is I'm trying to do or... Well, they say when you make a decision, then the universe kind of moves you toward that. Yeah, but I mean, the other, just two days ago, I had, I, I walked into um, Umalina to get, to see if I could get my nails done because I just walked off the plane and I had some hours to kill. Umalina said, oh, Day Spa here yeah, in yeah. Seattle. They said, oh, you know, we just had a cancellation. The universe is like taking you to get a <laughs> massage. So I don't, I don't do the universe thing, okay. but I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I just feel like once you've made that right decision for yourself, there does seem to be this sort of current pushing you forward that doesn't seem to be, have anything to do with the decisions that you've made when it absolutely has everything to do with the decisions that you've made. And I don't know where that comes from, but I've experienced that enough in my life to think this is something worth exploring. And, and you know, by in a serendipitous moment, a, a friend of mine wrote this book about serendipity. I'm like, you, this is my life that you've just written this book about, you know. So I, I relate to that concept of how you can create your own life quite powerfully. Do you think there's a way to tap into that? Or, or for you, is there a way to tap into it? Or have you just... The, so let's say you've had... Let's say this is your fourth iteration of Beth. Yeah. And what you want to do with your life. What happened in those in-between times when you were doing maybe what you wanted to do? You made a decision to stick it out with Microsoft for 10 years or you were at Amazon X number of years. But did you ever feel like there's more, but I don't know what it is? Or did you feel like I'm, I'm satisfied, I'm, I'm happy. And then it wasn't until you weren't happy, and you needed to find something else that you kind of you can look back and go, Oh, yeah, that wasn't 100% me. Yes. And the reason for that, and this is something I've known since childhood is that Everything I do has to be purpose driven. And if there's a, a purpose that's meaningful to me behind the activity, I have an impossible time completing it. So it was very difficult for me. I was one of those kids in school. It's like, I don't see the point in this. So I just couldn't do it for the sake of doing it. I hate games. I've never, even as a kid, I had very few toys. I didn't want to play games or board games. I'm like, this is just a way to pass the time. <laughs> like, what's the point in this? I've <laughs> always been like that. So, Were you a pain in the butt to your parents? No, I was a perfect oh, okay. angel. Oh, of course. <laughs> Come on. Obvious. Yeah. Um, my mom said my first little word that I ever said was "Ami do it, which was like baby speak for let me do it. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, oh, there was a thread there. But yeah. um, she brings that up a lot. Thanks, mom. So sometimes at work, if I felt like the work I was doing was very purpose driven and it was great, then I'm fully engaged. But if I, if it wasn't, then, and, 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 and that's. Were you be- questioning a lot? And were you a pain in the butt to your colleagues I was, because of that? And, and the, the downside of that is like, sometimes I really let some of my colleagues down where um, they needed me to do something for them. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. And I would kind of like either do a bad job. And I would feel terrible about that too. So I try to like avoid situations like that now where I know I'm not going to do a good job for my colleague. And yeah, Because you don't, because you're not buying into it. Exactly. I couldn't just do it to support them. I'm like, but the point of doing this, it doesn't make any sense to me. And you know, that, that was just always like a growth area that I needed to work on. But yeah, if something is purpose driven and you know what your values are, then it gets kind of, it gets quite clear. You know, and you just have to sort of plug in to something that helps you achieve that, that meaning for yourself and what you're doing. When you look back at those times when you maybe disappointed a colleague, do you think, well, I should have just done it because I said I was going to do it? Or do you think that you should have maybe passed it on to somebody else? Or do you think that you could have tricked your mind into making it purposeful? Any of those would have worked. Okay. And I didn't do any of them. Okay. Everybody has things they can improve upon, right? That was, that's kind of like my... Oh, yeah. Hindsight. You sure hindsight, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. You just hope you don't uh, speak for myself. You hope you don't hurt people along the way or insult people or whatever. Which... I mean, just very entrepreneurial by nature, but I just never knew what, exactly what it is I wanted to do. And I also needed to kind of mature enough to say, yeah, I can kind of, you know, helm the ship now. I'm ready for this. And again, this is a serendipity piece of it. I mean, there were all of these things kind of coming together at this particular moment that said, okay, this is it. This is your launching pad. Are you 50? Is that right? 48. 48. Okay. So approaching 50, do you think that, sorry, I don't want to push you there. I'm open. I'm fine. Ask, 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 ask. No, no, no. I don't, I meant, I didn't want to push you to 50 when you are only 48. You're a youngin. Do you feel like there is an age part of that for you or do you just think it's just natural maturation? Yeah, it, for me, it's maturation. Uh, it took me a, longer to get here than it does some other people. So but. you're like my Dodge Dart? 
I'm like your Dodge Dart, but I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, you're here. Going 100 miles an hour. Awesome. Everybody should be a Dodge Dart. <laughs> sure, everybody <laughs> should be a Dodge Dart. Some... Yeah. Did Just... have like, you know, well, I'm 48 years old, so the, you know, carburetor or whatever's getting a little rusty. <laughs> it hurts. And it takes a very long time to get me started in the morning. No, well, that's okay. <laughs> I'm working so on it. Your coffee can uh, work on that. How is it as a woman entrepreneur? I know that you have a history in the tech industry, which is generally male dominated. You probably run into some interesting, interesting stories or, you know, interesting history there. And just in terms of being a woman in technology, do you feel like now that you're an entrepreneur, like you said, you can do things on your own terms? Or are you still feeling like, well, I'm, I'm still kind of getting a little bit of backlash because I'm the I'm the woman here who's starting the business? I think that I may be a bit blind and naive to the biases against me because I'm a woman. And also, I'm still pretty new at this. You know, I was never in a leadership position in the tech world. I certainly experienced some hostility toward, you know, or perceived incompetence where maybe a male in my position would have been coached. That I'm sure of that, actually. And we're all growing, hopefully, so that that doesn't happen anymore. But I have this joke. It's a little bit blue. Can I say it? It's not that bad. You can cut it Oh, out please. No, 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 no. Go so for it. So I have this idea about all the strong women that I've worked with, either in IT or now in the entrepreneurial world, is that we women have huge balls. <laughs> They've just been relocated. <laughs> and so that's, sort that's of my That's a mantra. great philosophy. I made that up. I love that. Thank you very much. And, and I also happen to be very fortunate that in the Netherlands, there is this organization called The Next Woman, and it's female funders. Yeah, female entrepreneurs were established you know, supporting us up and comers. And it is, it is fantastic. These are women who are on the ball, who are tough, who are energetic, who are charismatic. And it's, it's just been an incredible organization for me. So I don't know, I've just kind of come into this at a really great time. And the energy in these, I was, I don't know, the idea of, the idea of um, women only things can, under certain cir- circumstances, really make my blood run cold. If it's yeah. in what circumstance and that I don't know if it, it, it just it's if it ends up into some sort of like knitting circle kind of thing. If, if as long as it's gezellig, that's great. But as um, long as it's what gezellig, the Dutch cozy. OK, word. <laughs> but that hasn't been the case with this group. I have a kind of a short attention span for like feeling feelings and thinking thinking that, and that kind of like the whole like like too much thing. navel gazing and sure um, yeah woo woo stuff a or? little bit yeah um okay. but this this or this group of women that i've fallen into have just been so marvelous and um but they're very they're very pragmatic about it that you know they, they've acknowledged that there's a you know a gap in female leadership that there are tremendous biases toward female um entrepreneurs that their pitches aren't often not accepted and so they're like well we're just going to intervene and create our own community and our own culture and help give these ladies a boost. And I really hope, it's one of my dreams of Ozarka, that I'm on the other end of that sooner rather than later so that I can in turn mentor and support more, you know, amazing, cool women coming up. And, and you know, we, they, we have this thing where they put us into groups and um, where the industries that we're in are sort of similar, but the ideas are very, very different. And some of these women have these unbelievable ideas that are exciting and viable ideas and we all get so excited about each other's business ideas that we really want to support each other making it work and and the energy is different I feel like everyone's listening to each other better and that you just kind of give somebody a moment to speak uninterrupted and it doesn't matter if you know they just got a new you know multi-million dollar round of funding or if they're just thinking about whether or not to to start a business, I think you know men tend to solutionize, and I, they, it comes from a great place. But I, you know, I one time it's just like, well, oh, geez, it seems that my computer's broken, and the guy next to me would be like, oh, it looks like you need to take it to IT. I'm like, yes, I know that, but he doesn't mm-hmm. mean to like condescend or patronize me. That's just, you know, it's a miscommunication. Like I just want to vent, yeah, and he wants to solve the problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think once we come to an understanding of just like the way that we communicate between men and d- women are sort of different, not put a judgment value on it, then. Maybe sometimes in those tiny little circumstances, we need to give the guys a break a little bit. So when they're not in the room, that's not, that never happens. And it's nice. It's great. Do you consider yourself to be bold? Almost to the point of being reckless. Yeah. What's that? What is that like for you being reckless? I think it just is the the like no fear thing. But you know, I am intensely introverted though. So I mean, it's not, I'm not shy, but I really need to retract to get my energy back. Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Like definitely, yeah, definitely you can, you can be bold and really be out there, but just be an introvert for sure. I would say that, yeah, I am. I am pretty bold. Do you have an instance that you could describe where you've been reckless, where it's been detrimental? 
for you or other people because you've taken chances? Well, I think I'm about to throw myself into the throes of financial ruin by uh, starting this business and not, you know, bringing in an income for a while. But it would only be ruinous if it's a disaster. Which it won't be. So, right, which know. it won't be. So it's it's only, you are, you're getting ready to take a risk and you have to watch your own language around that, right? Because it's just, it's a it's a risk, but don't uh, project that you're going to be ruinous. And I guess I'm just, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm honestly struggling to think of an example. So I'm just sort of... Resorting to humor that's not exactly based in truth okay. and not even that funny. Um, I might need to think about that for a while. Okay. I'm sure well, that people that know me could come up with lots of examples. But. Well, you know what? As long as you don't think that it's been reckless. I mean, you haven't you haven't lost a house over it. No, you haven't no. had your car repossessed. No. You haven't you haven't been sleeping on the streets. And this is something that is pretty important to know that I've had a pretty easy life, and it's pretty easy to be bold and make these granted gestures when there's not a whole lot to lose. And so, I mean, for me to be, you know, risky and start my own business, I don't have a lot at stake if it doesn't. And it's really important for me to be, um, to come, not come clean about that, but just for people listening to this to know. So financially. Sure. Or just, you know, I don't have children, so I don't have to think about providing for them. I don't need a lot. So I don't have some giant house that I, you know, that's taking up 60% of my income or whatever. You know, there's just not a lot for me to lose should I fail. That mm-hmm. would be catastrophic. Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree with you on that. And I, in many ways, I feel the same way. No kids. I can also live very simply. Like, yes, we have a beautiful house here, a newly remodeled house. Yet I spent many, 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 many years backpacking, you know, with a backpack on my back with nothing, you know, a pair, a couple pairs of shoes and a change of clothes and no money in the bank and working my way through Australia so I could keep traveling for another six months. And I can go back to that and I would still be happy. It would not bother me at all to do that. And, and I feel like that's part of why I can also take risks because Yes, I I do have a little bit of a safety net and I've got, I have less to lose, you know, just in terms of I don't have to, I don't have to support kids or kind of worry about that. But also I think both of us need to recognize that those are all choices to make too. And that someone else in your exact position might say, but I have my character and I've got, I've got all these things that I have to protect in terms of how people see me. And they might just take take it on a little bit differently that they would be they would be ruined if a business failed or if you if you opened a retail shop and then a year later you had to close it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess I'm I'm trying to think of examples of that, and it happened a lot when I decided to move to Amsterdam. That people were like, "But you don't know anybody there. You don't have any friends." And I knew that they were projecting their own fears onto me. And I would explain to them that that didn't really bother me so much. That Yeah, that word again, brave, came up. Where I'm like, this is a joyful choice for me. There's nothing scary about this at all. But I, And the other thing, too, is I have had probably close to a dozen people since I moved to Europe ask me how I did it because they wanted to move to Europe so badly, and only one person actually did it, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> so that I know of that has asked me to explain to them how I did it. Yeah, um, you do have to be, I think, singularly focused. Do you know Marianne Brannigan? Uh, she's a former Amazonian. She holds a dual passport, UK passport, and she just got herself to Dublin. But she, and she, so she's working for Oracle in Dublin. But it was kind of a similar thing that she went and visited, and then for two years she just spent her time figuring out how she was going to do it until she finally made it happen. You have so to I think really, really, yeah, want you it. do. Like to the exclusion of everything else because it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's really nice to really, really, really want something. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter if it takes a year or 10 years. If you want it, you're not going to stop until you get it. And the pursuit of it is enjoyable. And I think it's interesting that uh, that all paths, like you said, it may not be kind of the universe that's gearing you toward that. But I think when you make that decision, every decision you make after that is based on that bigger, that bigger purpose, Correct. that bigger goal. And it doesn't matter... Whether you decide to take a job or not take a job or make a purchase or save your money or, you know, put your $6 a day, your Starbucks habit, you know, into a coffee jar so that, you know, so that you can save money for the plane ticket for maybe a trip that you want to take. Somebody else maybe just wants to travel. sacrifice is enjoyable, you know, and I have in this moment when we're trying to get the business off the ground, I like a few little luxury things that most women like, and I'm not going to participate in those things anymore because it's every dollar spent that could be going toward the business. 
and if it feels fun it doesn't yeah, feel it's like worth, a sacrifice yeah it's worth it yeah uh, as we wrap up here anything that you want to cover that uh that we haven't talked about I wanted, I did want to make one point um, yeah. when you were talking about, you had said that there, you know, you had, you face these detractors. And one of the things I try and tell the young women, the young adult women in my life starting out is like receive feedback because you have a lot to learn, but approach all of it agnostically. And don't, if there's somebody you admire a lot, you know, that's telling you something that's maybe going against what you want to do, just use it as input. Don't stop doing what people tell you to do. And I think that because a lot of women have sort of that pleaser tendency, you know, or stop trusting themselves, like just use all of it as information. And <laughs> it's very Dutch of you. <laughs> and take what's useful to you. Well, you know, it was one of those, I came to this conclusion after the 50th performance review I had where I got the exact same like negative feedback. And I finally realized like this is not, this ain't going to change. This is who I am. So I, my boss and I were quite close and I said, I actually reject that feedback. I don't want to hear that anymore. This is who I am. And if this isn't working, then I'm going to find a position where we don't have to deal with this anymore. But to be told over and over and over again, like, this is a problem, you know, I think it would be good for women to say, well, is it or should I just make an adjustment or a shift here? Do you remember what that was, that feedback? Oh, it probably had something to do with, you know, coming up with grand ideas and having a hard time executing them or something. But it wasn't that. I don't. Okay. I'll let you know. Fair enough. Yeah. But that's great. It's so out of my brain that <laughs> yeah, I'm that already off onto this new world. It's a completely irrelevant. But I, I would hope, I hope that that's something that, you know, people, especially us women, could be a little bit better at I think is and discerning it yeah discerning it yes mm -hmm. that's the word yeah that is good this is the be bold podcast what does it mean to you to be bold I think the boldest and best thing that women can do that people can do is come to a place of self-acceptance because after you do that everything else gets easier that is the the ultimate expression of being bold as far as I can see do you have a formula to get there? And I ask that because I think it's it's so much more difficult, especially for women. So let's just go like with women. I think it's so much more difficult today than it was even 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. I think I, do, I would not want to be a, a teenager or a 20-something right now. It's, it's hard. There's a lot of stuff to live up to, and you're constantly being scrutinized. Yes, I think that we have placed so much emphasis on achievement and ambition and, and, and as a result, you know, a praise and acknowledgement and, ref and recognition of these achievements that we are lost in that. And um, what's the, exp what's, I think, who, who was, you're going to know who this was. It was a Dalai Lama or Gandhi or one of these guys that said the world is filled with successful people. What we need intensely is, you know, loving, compassion, mm, yeah. compassionate, kind people. That's totally true. And life is so short and we're these tiny, tiny little atoms in this giant universe and none of it really matters a whole lot. And yet it totally matters <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> so it is a waste of time to be unhappy or self-defeating or feeling like a failure because you haven't lived up to this like fleeting cultural moment of what the expectation is to be considered to be like, you know, a successful person or a person worthy of admiration, I guess. The only person that needs to admire you is you. And the sooner that everybody can get to that place, the, you can spend the rest of your life, you know, being a lot happier. So yeah, again, it goes back to that thing, like accept the feedback that's relevant to the things in you that you want to improve. And if people are like knocking on a door that's never going to open, just call them, you know, stop, get, tell them to stop. Move on. Move on. <laughs> move. Move house. Yeah, exactly. Got to stop talking in metaphors. Okay. Uh, where can people find you or Ozarka? The website is ozarka.biz, B-I-Z. I'm Beth at ozarka.biz. And, we, you know, if you want to Google Ozarka NL or Ozarka Amsterdam, then all of our social media stuff comes up. Great. Um, and I'll link to all of those in the show notes, too, so people can find it directly. Thanks for coming over today. An absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming to Seattle. You have big news. You just sold your house here in Seattle. So the move is, it probably feels more permanent. It does. Now. You don't have that that kind of thread, that tie. It doesn't. Thing. I went over to my, the house that's now somebody else's house and just kind of gave it a little pat and thanked it for, you know, being so kind to me all these years. And, you know, it's, it's, Seattle is so beautiful. And it was sort of nice to sort of walk through the streets today as the 26 year old that I was when I first moved here, just remembering how in awe I was of this place. And it's changed a lot. It's a, it's a real big city now. It used to be a toy city as my aunt always called it. And it's not anymore. But those few little pockets that are still there on 
when I was there that haven't been knocked down yet. But know. it's still beautiful and interesting it's and green. Yeah, yeah it's it an is. extraordinary place and it treated me very well. But yeah, it's time to, time to move on. Yeah, thank great. You, Seattle. Yeah. yeah. And thank you, Beth. <laughs> thank you, Beth Massa. <laughs> and I will uh, get booking on some flights <laughs> to come see you or definitely on my next flight through. Well, there's a houseboat with a spare wherever. spare room with your name on it. So you'll We'll be there. Be Absolutely. Okay. Thanks again for your time. Appreciate it. So many people I know say they want to live somewhere else, but so few are so driven and determined to make it happen that I just love hearing a success story like Beth's. As you know, I'm always on the lookout for new podcast guests. If you know of anyone or you yourself would be a good fit, simply fill out the guest submission form on the BeBoldPodcast.com website. I often record in Seattle. I always record in person. Uh, I'm often doing it here in Seattle, but I'll be traveling this fall. I'll be in Kauai in mid-September. I'll be in New York City in late September, and I'm looking at trips to San Francisco, Los Angeles, and or Portland. So if you are in that area or you know someone who is, then definitely let me know. You can send me a note at beth at beboldpodcast.com. For show notes, check out the BeBoldPodcast.com website for each episode and sign up for email alerts each time a new episode comes out. While you're online, go to the Be Bold Podcast Facebook page and give that a like. You can connect with me by friending me on Facebook and I'm WanderGal on Instagram. You can find out more about me by visiting wanderlustandlipstick.com. Sign up for my newsletter on the Wanderlust and Lipstick site and you'll receive a series of tips for making your travels safer. As I mentioned uh, in past episodes, you can find out about the tours I lead at wandertours.com and that includes the trip to Papua New Guinea. Ladies, don't forget to join the Be Bold Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Be Bold group. You're going to love the positivity, encouragement, and support from that community. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Be Bold podcast. Until next time, be bold.